So good to be together. I tell you, I look forward to Sunday mornings. I look forward to see the family and to sing about our great God, to even some songs we sing to each other as we encourage one another. And I'm so really, really grateful that we are indeed uh, walking uh, this path of the epic battles. Today, Samson, the strong did not survive. Of course, we all had a chance to read beforehand uh, the scripture so that we can get a little bit of insight. And some of you may have asked this question because, may have asked this question to yourself, because you certainly, some of you asked it to me. What are you going to talk about when you talk about Samson? Because there's not much that is redeeming, if you know what I'm saying about, Sam, about Samson. But um, I think we've got something uh, to talk about this morning. And, and, and prayerfully, uh, we will be encouraged and inspired after we're done today. I want to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about the history of God's people. Because the story of Samson without that context, honestly, can throw us for a loop. Or worse yet, starts teaching some stuff that is simply not sound. And we're going to be a congregation that takes the Word of God very seriously. As a matter of fact, it is stories like Samson that strengthens my conviction about this being the Word of God. Because this story, if you want to write a story that is full of inspiration and that is filled with imitatable characteristics, Samson is not one of those people. Yet he made it in Hebrews 11 in the Hall of Faith. Of course, we know, let's go all the way back. When God made man, he said that the inclination of all their hearts was only evil all the time. And so he had a flood. And in that flood, the entire world was wiped out except for Noah, his wife, his three sons, and of course, his three wives. Their three wives. And then these sons, after the flood happened, they populated the earth. Ham, one of the children, had a son. And his name was Canaan. Then after that, the people then went to different parts of the land and they inhabited the land. And the land was called after their names. Not unlike where some places are named today that someone finds it or discovers it, well, you don't really discover it, right? Because it's always been there. Uh, you, 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 you went there, and, uh, and, uh, and the land is named after you. We have stadiums named after people that have donated a lot of money. And so there was this man by the name of Canaan, and Canaan inhabited the, the land. That's where his family lived. And then, of course, time went on, and we had a guy that's introduced to us by the name of Abraham. Abraham was the grandson of Ham. His father's name was Terah. And God said to Abraham, he made a promise to him. And he said, I am going to give you the land that Canaan is living in. As a matter of fact, we sing about those song, a song like that. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way. Of course, we believe that's a foreshadowing of the ultimate Canaan land, which is heaven. And that's the song that we're going to sing about. We're going to realize in a few minutes the Canaanites were not people at this point in time that had very much redeemable characteristics. 
Nonetheless, God promised to Abraham was that he was going to inherit this land, him and his offspring. Abraham says, awesome, fire me up. But as Abraham was getting along in years, he did not have a child. As a matter of fact, his wife could not bear any children. And of course, as often in the scriptures, we realize an angel comes, speaks to them, and said, you are going to have a child. Does this sound familiar? Okay, that's the story of, uh, of uh, Samson as well. But he, they're going to have a child. Because Abraham was struggling a little bit. He says, How do you, what do you mean by my offsprings are going to inherit the land? As a matter of fact, Abraham struggled in his faith and started sleeping with his maidservant because he said, maybe that's what God meant, that we're going to have children through my maidservant because my wife cannot have any children. So nonetheless, what happens is that God says to Abraham as he was struggling, he says, come, come outside. Look at the stars in the sky. Your offsprings are going to be as many as those. Look at the sand on the seashore. Your offspring is going to be as many as those. Abraham says, now I know you have lost your mind. <laughs> and of course, right after that, we realize that Sarah had a son. And God made a promise to Abraham. And here's something I want you to think about as a recurring theme in God's word with God's people. God keeps his promise. Okay, I know that was the, big, the obligatory amen. God keeps his promise. We know what it's like when someone promises us something and they do not deliver. Sometimes out of the fact that they can't deliver or sometimes it's out of the fact they won't deliver. But there is something about our God that we have got to understand that God keeps His promises. And we're going to go, we're going to see the lengths that it goes to. Remember we talked about the immutability of God, that God does not change. When He says something, it is going to happen. And that's where Samson fits in the history of God's people. But let's continue a little bit of the overview. So we have Abraham. God promises to Abraham, you are going to inherit the land called Canaan. Ultimately, the people of God continue to multiply. Abraham's descendants become so many. And then there was a famine. There was a famine in Egypt. And so they had to go to Egypt to get some food. Of course, we know that's Joseph's, Jacob's children, ultimately. And jo Joseph was sold into slavery. He then was uh, sold to an Egyptian, went to Egypt. And then his brothers came there to get food. They realized, wait a minute, not only can we get food here, we need to move here. And so the people, the descendants of Jacob, moved to Egypt. And that family was held in bondage there for about 400 years. They were used and abused. And God promised them that you are going to ultimately, like I promised to Abraham, you are going to inherit Canaan. And so what happens through one of the epic battles we're going to have is Moses and the Pharaoh. But through some incredible miracles, God orchestrated some estimated between now they had after 400 years had become between two and five million people. Had the mass exodus out of Egypt and went through ultimately to go into Canaan. If you remember the story, 
The Bible says because of the sin that the people had been involved in, mainly they were pantheistic in their belief, and some were atheistic, some were polytheists. They had forgotten their Lord God. That is a recurring theme in the scriptures. God says, do not forget me. Remember the Lord. But they had forgotten. And in, and in a very real sense, there was a spiritual cleansing in the desert for 40 years. They wandered in the desert. And the people who only who were of age, meaning 20 and younger, were allowed to enter the land flowing with milk and honey. With two notable exceptions. The two spies, Joseph and Caleb, the, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb, that went out to, to spy out the land and says, yes, this is a land that we can absolutely take over. And so for 40 years, they wandered in the desert because God was going to fulfill his promise to Abraham ultimately. He did whatever it took to fulfill that promise. Performed some remarkable feats. Not the least of which when he parted the Red Sea. And all the people of God walked across the Red Sea on dry ground. And as soon as they finished, as Pharaoh's army was chasing them, that they were drowned in the Red Sea. And so we pick it up. They're now going into the land that God promised. Get this. 4,000 years ago. About 2,000 years. And God says, I will for uh, um, 4,000 years Abraham was. And so we're talking now. These guys are about to enter the land flowing with milk and honey that God promised to Abraham. Here's the issue. We know the story that Moses was ultimately the first significant leader, right, that was bringing the Israelites. And so what did he say? God said to him, Moses, go up on the mountain. I want you to look over Canaan. Do you see it? Awesome. You're not going to enter it. As a matter of fact, somebody else that you have groomed and that you have trained is going to lead the people into the land flowing with milk and honey. And that, of course, was Joshua. And Joshua now is leading the people into the land flowing with milk and honey. And so that is an overview of the history of God's people. Okay? And I will bring into context how Samson fits into this. Because one of the great disservices that we do to the scriptures and the people prey on people's ignorance is there's a lot of reading Isaiah 7, Ephesians 2, John 6. I mean, a lot of scriptures. Now, a lot of these scriptures are standalone, but we do ourselves a great disservice by not reading the scriptures into context and understand the flow of what God is doing and God is accomplishing in his word and ultimately with us. And here's one of my significant concerns about Christendom today. Is that we make our, a God that we serve about us. And we say some crazy things. That somehow, somewhere... The God focuses on me so much, almost to the extent of nobody else. And we don't see the ultimate big overall scheme of what God is doing in his word. And God promised to Abraham, I will give you the land of Canaan and all the lengths that God went through, and Joshua now has appeared on the scene. 
Moses was not allowed to enter the land. And so we pick it up in Joshua chapter 24. So in Joshua chapter 24, Joshua is about to, he's about to die in Joshua 24 and verse 14. He's talking to all the people, the Israelites, and he's saying, I've got a last few words for you. Let me talk to you guys for a few minutes. And he says in verse 14, so, so you understand the context of how we got here, right? How God promised to Abraham and how they ultimately had a famine in Egypt and then all uh, the, the, the people then uh, multiplied and now they're about to get the fulfilled promises because these are descendants of Abraham. And they're going to get the fulfilled promise that God made to Abraham a long time ago because God does not lie, does not change his mind and didn't say scratch that delete erase he will fulfill his promise and so Joshua gathers all the people and he's giving them a motivational speech he says now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness Put away the gods that your, forf that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will ser serve the Lord. Okay, sounds pretty good, right? The, the people answer, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved them in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. These guys are saying, Joseph, um, Joshua, dude, we got it. We understand. We are not going to forget our God. He's awesome. This is what he did for us. I know the story. Okay. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Hey, listen, Joshua, you can't talk me out of not serving God. But Joshua said to the people, a most remarkable statement that is a very, very, very important statement. And he says this. You are not able to serve the Lord. Get this. For he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forget, forgive your transgressions or your sins. And God says, uh, um, Joshua says, I know you guys are very enthusiastic. And I appreciate your zeal. But I am concerned with a grave concern. Because I'm not sure you understand God and who he is. He's holy and he's jealous. Two qualities that we need to embrace and understand. And I think this is a forgotten God in our day and age. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. Joshua is counting the cost with them. I was studying the Bible with a, with a young man earlier, and he, and, and he said to me, I said, you know, when I sit and study the Bible with people, the, depending where they're at, when I quote-unquote count the cost with them, I do one of two things. Depending after getting to know them, I try to encourage them to realize, man, what it's like to be a Christian. But sometimes when some people are so positive and optimistic, and, uh, I try to talk them out of being a Christian. So it all depends to whom I'm speaking. And Joshua is saying, hey, listen, God, I, I know you're fired up, but I want you to understand what this means. 
And verse 21, And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. And then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen, to, chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Yes, that's what we said. That's what we're going to do. You can call us witnesses. He said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will not obey. And so they're saying, okay, Joshua is about to go to the to, to way to the earth. And he says, I want to warn you guys, do not forsake God. He's holy. He's jealous. He's not fooling around. And so that's the context here. He warns them. The Bible tells us that, as a matter of fact, through all the days of Joshua and even the people that were uh, the leaders and elders and judges during the time of Joshua, that the people remained faithful to God. But Joshua warned them pleaded with them, tried to help them to understand. Not unlike when Jesus said, you want to follow me? I have no place to lay my head. You want to follow me? You understand what it means? And so that's the context. And so Joshua dies, and then a most remarkable thing happens. A most remarkable thing happens. For the next 350 years, there was a cycle of sin that occurred with the Israelites. Guess what? They forgot their God. As a matter of fact, they got so assimilated culturally and even religiously with the people because not all the Canaanites were driven from the land. There were some that were still there. And they got assimilated into that culture and bought, and bought what the Canaanites were selling. And they forgot their God. The very thing that Joshua said, do not do. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They didn't understand how jealousy is. That God does not take lightly when we go after other gods. That's not something to be trifled with. And so for the next 350 years, and I've, I think I've got a map up here. I wanted to show you a little bit to give you some context. I don't know if you guys can see this, but uh, I don't have my... Okay, here we go. We got it. What do I have to do? Right here? Right there. Awesome. <laughs> As you can see, there are different judges over the last for, for the 350 years or so. There we have Ehud and Deborah. There we have Samson. There, Philistia. We'll, we'll understand that in a, a little second. There we have, there we have um, Elon and and so what we got to understand, thank you, what we got to understand here is that this was the layout of the land. And you remember that all the 12 tribes, right, were given different parts. And this is where we were. To give you some context of the, of the judges in the book of Judges, um, they were not all in one place and they were leading from one place. They were in different places. And you will find out that God used these judges were, that were from different tribes uh, over and over again. As a matter of fact, there were some times that the judges were leading simultaneously. It was not necessarily one over the other. But the big issue is this. Oops, I forgot. I got out of here. Um, the big issue is this. They have forgotten their God. They got culturally involved and religiously and adopted the gods of the Canaanites. They fell into sin, and God said, I am, do you, did you forget? Do you understand? 
I don't take lightly to this. There are a lot of sins that I would overlook if my wife were to commit. And boy, did she commit a lot. Um, I would overlook a lot of sins. Adultery is a difficult one. There will be something in my heart, the jealousy. As a matter of fact, God says it's the only sin, in a manner of speaking, that I'm going to give you okay for you to get a divorce. It's not what I intend, but it's okay because I know what that's like. God understands a jealous heart because God is jealous. And he's saying, you're giving your hearts to other people? Other gods? There's really no God at all? And God says, when they fell into sin, predominantly that, idolatry, he sent people from different lands, okay? People from Ammon, the Ammonites, the Moab, the uh, uh, Moabites, e Edom, the Edomites, and you go on and on. People that were still in the land, God then said, you guys are not listening to me. I'm going to give you over so that you understand you can't do this. It's not right. Not only that, do you not understand how holy I am? You call yourself my people? And so invariably, there were intermittent, intermittent times where God says, after they had fallen into sin, the people then would realize, oh my goodness, we're under this incredible slavery. It sort of remind me when we were in Egypt. Not cool. I'm going to repent. So the people repented after they were sent to deliver someone that was a judge. That's what, when you think judge, don't think magistrate. Think a deliverer, a leader, a military leader. And God intermittently over time sent someone to rescue them after they were being oppressed by some other people. And guess after that deliverer came in, there was peace for a few years. And guess what happens again? They fell into sin and God sent them again. A uh, 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 deliverer after they have been oppressed and they repent and then there was peace. And guys, this happened not once, not twice, over a period of approximately 350 years. And then Samson comes on the scene. So we pick it up, Joshua, sorry, Judges chapter 13. So you see the context, right? One of these people was Samson. As a matter of fact, he was the last judge that came on the scene. Perhaps the most famous, certainly the most notorious. Judges chapter 2, verse 5. So we'll read a little bit here. Uh, uh, chapter uh, 13, rather, verse 2. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For, uh, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. And so God now, after a few years again, the, that whole cycle comes in, Samson comes on the scene. A lot of times when God is bringing about someone for a special purpose, there's always extremes that are there so that we understand this was not a coincidence. 
the whole idea, right, with, with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or with uh, uh, David against Goliath, and, and, or Daniel in the lion. Uh, I mean, they're, they're exaggerated situation. Here she's barren. It's obvious this is not going to be a coincidence. Wow. And God says, this is who Samson is and what he is going to do. Verse 22. So we'll go over this real quick to get an idea of what's happening. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things or now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son and called him Samson. And the young man grew and the Lord blessed him. By the way, always listen to your wife. He was panicking. He was saying, oh my goodness, we saw the Lord, we're going to die. Let's just go ahead and get, get everything all ready. His wife said, Sammy, no, Sam, Manoah, Manny, <laughs> chill out. Use your noggin. If God wanted to destroy us, it would have happened. He wouldn't allow us to do the burnt offering and the grain offering kind of stuff, okay? So, amen. Let, husbands, listen to our wives. Chapter 14. So Samson comes along. Let's look at some exploits of Samson. It says, Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came toward him and roaring. And then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him and and. Although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion to pieces as one tears a young goat. By the way, I don't even think it's easy to do a young goat, a tear young, but that's what it says, so I'm reading it. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked to the women, and she was right in his eyes. So, Samson, okay, these guys were so, here's this guy that was chosen by God to be the deliverer of Israel. You'd think, man, this guy is just so righteous. He is, he is, he's doing all the right thing. As a matter of fact, he, he's going to go do something that God absolutely spoke very clearly again. Do not go and marry foreign women, people that are not people of God. And of course, what did he go? That's exactly what he did. And we pick it up in verse 14. He says this, and so what happens? And he said to them, he's not playing a game. This guy is just absolutely not focusing on what needs to be done. His parents said, listen, can't you find someone in, uh, in Israel that you can, you know, marry? And he said, no, she looks good in my eyes. That's who I want to marry. And he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something to sweet, something sweet. And in three days, they could not solve the real. And so what happened is he killed this lion. And then when he was walking back again near this lion, he stuck his hand into the lion and got some honey. And he said, let me make a riddle of this. Out of the eater came something to eat, which is honey. Out of the strong, which is the lion, came something sweet. Just playing total games. Verse 18. What happens is, and then the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun down, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? By the way, this is the first case of Jeopardy. <laughs> How did they answer? In the form of a what? That was the answer. What is, what is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? And so what happened was he said, hey, listen, I am going to have a bet. If you guys can solve this riddle, I'm going to give you 30 pieces of clothing. If you can't, you give me 30 pieces of clothing. This woman was saying, please tell me, please tell me, please tell me, until finally she wore him out. And he told the answer. And we realize in verse 18, he, he says, the riddle, and in verse 19, he says, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. He went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men out of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those 
who had told the bride. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. Guys, this is a mess. Samson goes there, gets married to this woman, left, comes back a few months later, and realized the father of the bride said, I don't think Samson was serious about my wife, and so I just gave her to someone else. Do you see the chaos that's going on? That's what happened. That's the chaos that's going on here. Then another time, I don't have time to talk about this. We'll just skip through uh, the, the, the next few scriptures, but read it. But, but, but let me summarize for you. Samson goes back, and when he finds us out, he says, what are you guys doing? He found some foxes together, tied them together, let them put some fire on their, on their tails, went into the grain field, and burned the whole thing down. Then they got upset. These guys said, okay, who did this? Samson. So this is what the, 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 the Philistines did. We are going to punish you. And you know how we're going to punish you? We are going to kill your wife, burn her like you did ours, and we're going to burn her father as well. And that's exactly what they did. That's the condition of the state that was going on here. And Samson said, okay, now I am justified. I am going to beat you guys to a pulp. He looked around. He found a bone, the bone of a donkey. And the Bible tells us that he killed a thousand men. Now, interestingly, remember, look at it another time. A Nazarite vow, you don't deal with dead people. You don't cut your hair. You don't drink alcohol. All these things. We haven't seen about the alcohol thing, but he is not doing faithful to any of the Nazarite vow. He just probably thought, long hair, cool, awesome. <laughs> and so that's what happens. He, he's this, this brute of a guy who is defying God's word over and over and over again. In chapter 16, then he meets this girl by the name of Delilah. Here's the issue with Delilah. He said, she looks good. Guess where she was from? She was a Philistine, exactly. Another time again. And the people, the leaders, said, okay, we need to get no, realize why is this guy so strong? Delilah, can you find out for us? As a matter of fact, we each are going to give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Interestingly, throughout God's word, we realize people being sold for silver. As a matter of fact, let me give you an idea how much money this was. Apparently, at that time, 10 pieces of silver was one year's wage. Each of them were going to give her. She said, you don't have to tell me twice. And of course, what she did, she found out. She whined. Initially, he didn't tell her the truth. And then eventually, she said, do you even love me? And he told her the truth. And of course, we know what happens. Samson, they shaved his head. It wasn't that his strength was in the hair. Strength was in his faithfulness and commitment to God. And God ultimately gave him the strength. Well, we understand that. Just like the strength was not in David's slingshot. It was God, right? It was not in the hair. And so we find out that Delilah eventually got him to tell where his strength comes from. The Philistines come. They tie him up after they've shaved his head. They gouge out his eyes. He is an absolute at the mercy of the Philistines. Here is this man who started off so well. Now literally being tortured we pick it up in verse, chapter 16, in verse 25. 
It says, and when their hearts were merry, the Philistines were making a mockery out of Samson. They say, let's bring that strong man. Let's, let's, let's have a little fun with him. Taunting is what happens a lot. Remember, they taunted a guy called Jesus, right? That's what they were doing here. They were making fun of him. And when their hearts were merry, they called Samson that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison that he entertained them. Then he made his, him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the young man who had held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof there were about 3,000 men and women who looked while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord, O Lord, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O, Lord, o God, that I may avenge I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, and his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed during his life. When all seemed to be at lost, when he had gotten to the end of his life, he said, God, please, one more time, hear my cry. It is my conviction that if we go and try and get some stories to glean from Samson, we will miss the point. This story is not about Samson. It's about God. It's about God fulfilling His promise. And He says, you cannot mock me, you cannot worship me, and you cannot make fun of me and think this is just trifling. And Samson, in spite of his arrogance and in spite of his murdering ways and in spite of his infidelity and in spite of his disobeying God, God still used him. It's not about God. It's not about Samson. It's about God. This is not license for us to do whatever we want, but also it provides hope. This is a story. Can you, is there a greater story of God's grace than this guy who was a derelict and still God used him? Even at the last moment, I know when I was a younger man, I used to think, man, I know God is good. I know his stories. And you know, before I die, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask God to come into my heart. And just before I die, so because I know that's the God that saves. That's the way, that's the way I, I thought. Not understanding at all and trying to take totally out of context what Samson did and who he is. Because if you do that, you forget what God says. He's holy and he's jealous. And this is about God fulfilling his promise ultimately to Abraham. And we know what happens after that, right? The kings start coming in. And then David ultimately conquered the entire land. And that's why David is described as Israel's greatest king, because he's the, he's the one that actually conquered. Joshua didn't. Certainly through the times of the judges, they didn't. They just got culturally. And guys, maybe some lessons to learn here is that have we so assimilated into our culture that we're indistinguishable in our faith and our conviction? And let me tell you something. There's no country greater than Canada 
that serves and tries to do good for people of all backgrounds, of all dispositions. And so there is a semblance of goodness, but not God type of goodness. You understand what I'm saying? And I think there's a lesson here for us. That God says, listen, he said, I'm going to have Samson do a Nazarite vow, which was, you know what a Nazarite vow was? It was saying, I'm consecrating myself to you, that I am doing some radical things to show I am different from everybody. And so, as we're about to take the communion, this story is about the graciousness of God and God keeping his promises. It's not about us having license to do whatever we want, marry whomever we want, kill how many people we want, so that, you see, God's still going to use me, and I'm going to be more productive at the end of my life, ultimately in totality, than when I live my whole life. See how gracious God is? That is a complete and utter misunderstanding of God's Word, and you do that to your own detriment. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We'll pull this all together. Romans chapter 8. Paul writes and he says this in verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The next statement is one of the most crazy statements in the whole Bible, and I can tell you for the longest time, I literally read over this verse, and I thought, cool, but let me read it. And in this context of God doing whatever he takes to fulfill his promise, whatever it takes, he is going to do, and this is what he did. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In order for God to fulfill his promises ultimately to us, that we, he will gather unto himself a people that are his own, that ultimately we have become his people. And he says, I'm going to do to whatever lengths to be able to fulfill that promise, even if it costs me my son. That is what the Scripture says and how faithful God is to His promises. And that's why I'm concerned with modern-day Christianity that says God is all for me and He's me and, and, and He's there. He gives me a parking spot and He gives me nice sunglasses and nice clothes. Really? No. It's about God fulfilling His promise because He is holy, righteous, jealous, and He cannot lie. And He says, if I'm going to bring you, this is what it's going to take. If it costs me my son, I'm willing to pay that price. Salvation is not about us. It's about God fulfilling His promise. And we get to participate in that. And we come and we worship this great God. And church, my caution to us is that we don't come in here or wherever you go to worship with a malaise, with a flippant attitude, without preparation. He said, if it costs me my son to fulfill my promise, then I will slaughter him.
That's more than I can bear. So the idea, he says in verse 35, if we can go ahead and start, even start handing out the emblems. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So with that fact, he says, with how much God has shown he's loved us, who shall separate? He says, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness. You can go ahead and hand, hand them out and hold them in your hand before we have communion, please. Okay, thank you. He says, okay, now that you understand this, okay, what is going to separate us? So what is going to pull you away from God? Difficulties? Challenges? What is it? At what, at what point? What is your price? Not only what should separate us, nothing. And then he closes with verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither li death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This morning, as we're about to take the Lord's Supper, Let's realize the lengths that Jesus, the lengths that God went through to fulfill his promise to us. You know, it is because of God's promise that we have the hope of heaven. It's not because I got baptized. Okay, let me say that again. It's not because I got baptized I have the hope of heaven. It's not because I lived the life of a disciple, it's because I have the hope of heaven. This is not, not because I give a few dollars to church or I study the Bible with someone or I take care of the poor. Those are not the reasons why I have the hope of heaven. It's because God is faithful to his promise. And now what do I respond to that? Then I give my whole life. Okay, I need to get baptized. Sure, I need to live my life in the stop. Sure, I serve the poor. Sure, I help my brothers and sisters. Sure, okay, awesome. So as we take the Lord's Supper, Let us understand the cost and the lengths. And so therefore, guys, therefore, we can trust God's promise. We're going to sing a song in a few moments after the contribution prayer. We're going to sing a song about standing on the promises of God hopefully with different convictions, to realize the lengths to which God did. That story is not about Samson. It's about God. Let's pray. God, thank you that you did not spare your own son in order to fulfill your promise to us. Help us to have gratitude in our hearts as we think about what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.